Good evening everyone, time for another silver update. This is the one hour chart of gold provided by netdania.com. You can click on the link below. Now we've been watching this bottoming pattern in gold trying to determine if this is the actual bottom that's being put in place. Now if you remember I pointed out the reset on the MACD the last video we were around this price level was looking for a reset with a correction back to the last uh, resistance line which has become the support line you can see that we corrected back up now and we're starting to rally the MACD has fully reset so this stair step pattern is continuing and we're looking for a breakout above this line here to set the stage for the next advance. Now that's going to be a more difficult advance than the ones we've had because the prior ones really didn't have any significant overhead resistance, maybe a little bit right here. This resistance is going to be more significant because there's more time that it's been established, but the pattern is holding so far, so we're still looking bullish on the gold chart. The silver chart is not as strong. You can see that it has continued to rally weekly, but it is still above that trend line. We have this large area of resistance up here around the $21 price, $21.50 that we need to get to. Now we know that silver tends to follow gold. Uh, it tends to go ahead of gold on the downside and then lags gold on the upside until the upside move is established and then silver tends to accelerate past gold. That may be the type of pattern we're looking at here. Now I wanted to spend the rest of the night on this main story. This is about the base metals and I'm going to try to connect some dots here to try to explain to you why I think we're seeing what we're seeing in the base metals. So keep in mind that when you're talking about market manipulation, there are always going to be all types of unintended consequences. That's the thing that you get whenever you have central planning. The reason why governments like the Soviet communist government failed, uh, the Chinese government had to be reformed, the socialist nations of Europe are failing, is the failure of central planning uh, the attempt to control a market is much like trying to control the course of water. It's always going to uh, go around another way. That's the way markets work. That's because markets, as Adam Smith noted, are uh, controlled by the unseen hand. The unseen hand being the large number of intelligent actors who modify their behaviors based upon the price signals they receive. So markets are very difficult to manipulate and when you attempt to do so you have a lot of unintended consequences to deal with and that's what I'm going to try to show you here we're going to start off with a story that uh, was back in March of 2010 and this was the entry of I won't say the bullion banks I'll say the big banks but the big manipulator banks these are the banks that were left over after the last crisis these are the ones that were chosen to survive and there's no question that uh, the Federal Reserve chose which ones to support and which ones to destroy Lehman of course got the torch but let's look at this story here this is about Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan entering into the base metal business now when this story hit there was a lot of speculation a lot of people wondered why would it be that these banks would want to get involved in this business? A lot of the speculation was that they were going to try to manipulate the prices of the base metals in the same way they had manipulated the prices of the precious metals, perhaps trying to uh, create a corner on these metals and be able to suppress their prices. I'm going to try to show you that exactly the opposite is the case that the reason why these banks entered into those markets was not to suppress the prices of the base metals but was actually to 
manipulate higher the prices of the base metal. So let's read this here. Being long commodities may all well and good, given China at all, but it usually pays to follow what brokers do, not what they say, from Alphaville. As piles of base metals from aluminum to nickel build up due to poor demand, Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan have entered the little-known but very profitable business of metal warehousing. The deals reflect banks' appetite for exposure to physical commodities beyond traditional commodities derivatives. Stockpiles at the LME registered depots surged to an all-time high of 6 million tons, up 1 million in 2007. Traders and bankers say warehousing is a classical anti-cyclical business as it flourishes when demand for metals is lackluster and stockpiles mount. The move follows on from Goldman Sachs, which last week bought Metro International, the operator of a global network of London Metal Exchange approved warehouses for a princely sum of $550 million. Let's just say there are many ways to make money off of commodities for a range of market scenarios rather than owning physical assets. So that was a story that appeared in 2010. As I said, a lot of people speculated as to why they were getting into that business. Now I'm going to show you that the reason they got into that business was not to uh, suppress the prices of those, but actually to manipulate those prices higher. Now this article is from the New York Times and it's from July 20th and this is the latest on this issue. Mount Clemens, Michigan, hundreds of millions of times a day, thirsty Americans open a can of soda, beer, or juice, and every time they do it, they pay a fraction of a penny or more because of shrewd maneuver by Goldman Sachs and other financial players that ultimately cost consumers billions of dollars. The story of how this works begins in 27 industrial warehouses in the Detroit area where Goldman subsidiary stores customers aluminum. Each day, a fleet of trucks shuffles 1,500-pound bars of the metal amongst warehouses two or three times a day, sometimes more. The drivers make the same circuits. They load in one warehouse, they unload in another, and they do it again. This industrial dance has been choreographed by Goldman to exploit pricing regulations set up by an overseas commodities exchange an investigation by the New York Times has found. The back and forth lengthens the storage time and that adds many millions a year to the coffers of Goldman which owns the warehouses and charges rent to store the metal. It also increases prices paid by the manufacturers and consumers across the country. Tyler Clay, a forklift driver who worked at the Goldman warehouses until earlier this year called the process a merry-go-round of metal. Only a tenth of a cent or so of aluminum cans purchase price can be traced back to the strategy, but multiply that amount by the 90 billion aluminum cans consumed in the United States each year and add the tons of aluminum used in things like cars, electronics, and house siding, and the efforts by Goldman and other financial players has cost American consumers, consumers more than $5 billion over the last three years, say former industry executives and analysts, and it goes on. So if you remember, in a previous video, I talked about the discrepancies in the LME warehouse stock levels and the prices. So let's go through some of these base metals and look at this, and then I'll put the pieces together so you can understand. So this first chart is the five-year LME aluminum warehouse stock levels. Now, based on simple supply and demand, everybody knows that as supply goes up, uh, that if demand stays the same, it's going to cause prices to fall. We also know that we've been in a economic slowdown. You can look at the dry shipping rates. You can look at a lot of factors that will tell you that we're in an economic slowdown and we haven't broken out into an economic boom or recovery, really. So, but you can see here that warehouse stock levels for aluminum are at all-time highs. You would expect that if supply and demand were working properly, you would find that the five-year spot of this, which is this next chart, 
would be at all-time lows. It's not at all-time lows. It's actually a good 30-something percent higher than it was at the very bottom in 2009. We can go down to the zinc warehouse stock levels, and you can see those are near record highs. Nevertheless, the price of zinc on the five-year spot is still well above uh, nearly 30-something percent above the price it was at the bottom. Copper stock levels, of course, are very, very high, all-time highs, while the copper price is still more than 100% higher than this low price here. We'll just say this is 1,500. We're still above three. And the last one is the nickel warehouse stock. Same thing, all-time high, all-time record high, but again, the nickel spot price is not at all-time lows. So why do we see the disconnect in the base metals? Now, this is my theory, and I think this is probably going to be borne out by the news that's coming out. Of course, now they're beginning to announce they're getting out of this game. So if you're in the game of suppressing the precious metals, we know from... Uh, Jeff Nielsen pointing out about primary gold and silver mines that these mines they mine all of the metals uh, anytime you have a very productive mine you're gonna have a lot of base metals in tonnage you're also gonna have quite a number of the precious metals and they're all combined together we know that the primary silver mines pretty much don't exist anymore and that's because of the suppression of the price of silver so it's more profitable to mine the base metals and mine silver as a byproduct so if it's the case that we have a tremendous economic slowdown and the use of the base metals falls tremendously which is going to cause an enormous rise in the stockpiles of these base metals how are you going to keep the price high enough? Now, you have to remember that the motivation to keep the price of the base metals high is so that you can keep the mining up to get the metals that you really need, which are going to be the suppressed metals, gold and silver. The way you keep those prices up is you take over the warehousing of those metals and then you institute delivery delays. So that's exactly what we've seen over the last few years, the involvement of these banks in the warehousing of these base metals has caused the prices of these base metals to stay higher than they normally would be. Again, the warehouse levels and the price, they don't match. And the reason why they're doing that is that they're very very short on the precious metals but they cannot allow the price of the precious metals to rise to their true value if they did that then of course many mines would come online and uh, the problem would be solved we know that supply and demand the free market solves all these problems but just like telling a lie uh, we've got uh, Wiener in New York and uh, we know that once you tell a lie, you have to tell another series of lies to cover it up. So the bullion banks, the big banks, and the Federal Reserve have already involved themselves in the suppression of the precious metals. That has caused them or forced them to become involved in the rigging of the price of the base metals, keeping those metals high so that they can keep a large amount of mining continuing and uh, by doing so that allows them to get more precious metals I covered in the last video how they're actually scrounging around on the bottom of the ocean to try to come up with enough silver so that they can deliver it and uh, that's the same motive that they have by artificially pegging the price of the base metals at a high level that causes the mine to continue, which allows them to continue to get the needed supplies of 
precious metals, specifically gold and silver, without allowing the price to rise. So the bottom line is that once you begin to involve yourself in the manipulation of prices, just like telling a lie, you have to tell more lies to cover up the lie that you've told. We can see now that the price of gold is starting to rally. This scheme by the banks to prop up the base metal prices and allow them to mine more precious metals as a result, that scheme is starting to fall apart. And if that's the case, that the base metal mining scheme starts to fall apart, then what we should see based on these stock levels, of course, with the slow economy, is a complete collapse in these five-year spot prices. If we see a collapse in these spot prices, then that's obviously going to have a much more higher level of pressure exerted on the miners. They will be left with precious metals that aren't giving them a profit for mining them and then eventually base metals that aren't giving them a profit for mining those either. That will cause more and more mines to begin to shutter. That will produce a squeeze on the available amount of precious metals and of course that's going to be the perfect storm where we get the price of the precious metals exploding to the upside as the price of the base metals crashes. One has been manipulated to the a downside, the price has been suppressed, gold and silver have been suppressed in price, the base metals on the other hand, they have been propped up in price to keep the mining going and when this scenario reverses we're going to see a collapse in the base metal prices and an explosion in the precious metal prices and we'll talk to you next time.